four out of ten bats were puzzled to hear that it takes a sloth 30 days to digest a leaf. Mm -hmm. Two out of ten bats were discombobulated to hear that all roses are edible. Mm. Six out of ten bats couldn't believe the fact that crocodiles can't stick their tongues out. Seven million. 246,369.64 out of 10 bats were proper chuffed to learn that the white mulberry tree can fire pollen at speeds of half the speed of sound. Welcome to the final episode of 8 Out of 10 Bats. That two weeks has gone really fast. Sped by. It's gone super quickly. We've had a really wonderful time, obviously, here at the British Wildlife Centre, featuring live animals. We've got Harvest Mouse again to start the show, because simply, why not? It's the ultimate cuteness, little bundle of oh, gorgeousness. <laughs> it's really quick. Well, this one's quite active. It keeps trying to kind of look away. It's almost like it's going to leapfrog somewhere. Or oh, leap mouse, look at I that. Look at, look at the close-up now. Oh, little paws. It's a beautiful animal, isn't it? And it's fantastic that you can kind of get this interaction with them. Obviously, you can do that on the photography tours here at the centre. You can get some really great shots of this species. I'm rotating the mouse. You can really see that prehensile tail at work there wrapped around. Yeah, yeah you can. <laughs> it's my job at the British um, Wildlife Centre. I come here for those photography days and I rotate the mouse to make sure that it's facing the lens. I've been, yeah. I've been working as an art. I got it off of Matt Binstead. <laughs> He's a mouse rotator too, I'm sure. Aww. It is, though, joking apart, a fantastic place to come and take photographs. Many of the animals that are here are kept in very naturalistic enclosures. You don't need to pretend they're in the wild, but you can get some amazing photographs of them, especially the foxes and the otters, which are brilliant, aren't they? I know, they're so good. A lot of the animals you can kind of get really good close-up shots of, as you can see here. Ooh, it's a treat, isn't it? Hold to on, see I'm any just animal rotate like this. the mouse again. Rotating again. I like that. Well, uh, we are dwelling on the mouse. We could do a whole hour on this harvest mouse, oh, but no, I promise no, 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 a mouse's bottom, I've got to rotate. I oh, know, I quite like a mouse's bottom. Don't finish bottom. on a mouse's bottom. No, what's wrong with a mouse's bum? Uh, I don't, Look at I don't, that. What's now wrong it's showing us with its a mouse's bum. bum? That's the way to start wow. a programme, Beast. Well done. Yes, welcome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have a whole hour and a quarter of this because we had an extra 15 minutes in today's show. It's a finale, so we're going to treat you to some extra stuff. And we've got lots of good things coming up. George is going to go meet a very friendly badger, which is really exciting. And Quezzy is going to be on the soapbox talking about something quite passionate to her. Leaf by Sweden's here as well. Yes, exactly. Exactly, Leif per Sweden. Leif. Leif per Sweden, not Leif. No, I'm gonna, but he's, but he's a botanist. He's a botanist, yeah, I know, Leif was a good name. But Leif per Sweden is going to be here, he's going to be talking with Quasi a little bit. All about actually the plants that he's found here at the centre. Excellent stuff, excellent stuff. Yeah. But let's uh, start off straight away with a very beautiful film. Paul Goldstein is a remarkable photographer. He spends a lot of time he's working on the Mara Conservancies. Now, the Mara Conservancies are a group of protected areas around the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Paul has a camp there, Kichechi Camp. It's a fantastic place to visit. The density of the wildlife, the diversity of the wildlife is extraordinary. And he's been out and made a film about him photographing it. He's a very passionate photographer, he's a very good photographer and he's a very brave photographer because at the end of this film he has offered Megan and I the chance to judge three of his photographs very knowing, brave. knowing, very brave, Paul. knowing how brutal mm. and, uh, we can be when it comes to that. Um, look, the, the, the mouse... Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 almost had a mouse yeah. escape. Well, uh, mouse escape. Just before we go to Paul's clip we are just going to check in with Susie's word of the day as well. Yeah. Okay, Susie's word of the day. Of what the day. is it? Take it away Susie. Here's my teaser for today. What is the door doing in the word dormouse? Door. Door. Curious. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Any ideas? No. Got a, well, not a, clue. a couple of thoughts. Oh, wait, maybe... oh, no, I just thought, I think, I th I can think, I've just thought of it, I think. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Or is it a little bit of the French, maybe? 
Uh, Louis. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, no, I, I think I, I think I've cracked it. If okay. you crack it, of course, the first one to get the right answer has the chance of winning one of these uh, mud, uh, mud, <laughs> muds. <laughs> one of the how well, they'll be in the mud. Um, one of these mugs. Honestly, I don't know how many there are now. It's the oh. last of its kind. You must mention yeah. how yes. rare it is. That is the last one. Is it? Oh my goodness me! Right, someone's got to sit down at the kitchen table, pack them all up, and post them out. Who's that going to be? That'll be you. Yeah, that will be me. <laughs> anyway, getting back to Paul Goldstein and Kachechi. It's a beautiful film. Mm -hmm. Take a look at this as Paul goes out of Africa. We're in the middle of Mara North, and uh, I've got a week uh, to turn some fairly mediocre images into some decent ones that perhaps Chris and Megan might like even. So we've got the tools, the optics here, we've got a uh, slightly bigger optic here, uh, and we've got probably the most prolific, fertile, and best managed conservancy anywhere in the world, let alone Africa. So welcome to Patience and Pitfalls, and Paul probably coming out in spots. When you drive through hard-won parcels of conservation area, like Mara North in Kenya, you realize there are more important things than photographs. These lush and fertile pastures are prime examples of how, when all stakeholders benefit, conservation becomes second nature, rather than just a greenwash. However, as a hobby, profession, job, call it what you like, wildlife photography attracts thousands of people, many trying for that perfect shot, which of course, always evades them. What makes a good photo? Angle, light, symmetry, wow factor, background, all these things contribute, with most only arrived at after hard graft, but many pitfalls are waiting, lurking in the background, ready to ambush your perfect portrait. Weather, distractions, clutter, interference, crossover, and crucially, a lack of originality. Cliches are off the menu, unless they are utterly blinding ones. Essentially, all you really want is someone to look at your images longer than someone else's. A good photo is not just about decent composition or a degree in processing software geekiness. Research, field craft, no fear of failure, ambition, boldness and patience all combine and contribute before finally the finger fuses with the shutter release. That last part is only 5% of the transaction. And if you fail, so what? It's only a photograph, but oh my, is it frustrating. And if it wasn't, we wouldn't do it. Critically, the animals seldom behave. Time and time again, they refuse to compose themselves in any sort of behavior conducive to my viewfinder. Time and time again, they don't even bother showing up. And when they do, everything else is wrong. But this is both the beauty and indeed the beast of wildlife photography. The most important critic of your work has to be yourself. Always, except perhaps in this case, Chris and indeed Megan. If you find even a tiny detail wrong with your photograph, delete it, otherwise it becomes corrosive. Move on, try harder, get up earlier, study longer. In the short space of a week, with a couple of days on my own and a few guiding a dozen photographers, I foolishly tried to take on Chris's both rigorous and indeed often savage scoring system. Giving points for images may sound trivial, but it's one of the few ways you'll be able to know if you're getting any better. But get others to score them, and don't be oversensitive. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever been given was if you've taken it, don't take it again. I look for something new or anticipate what might happen next. Also, many of people I guide have seen images in books or online they would like to photograph themselves. They would perhaps be better served putting their own individual stamp or inflection on their imagery. Originality is tough when you have the rapacious demands now of social media and indeed the sheer number of people poking cameras at feathered and four-legged creatures. So often the critical call sign is new light through old windows which properly test the discipline and imagination of any photographer. Try to throw a new look on a tried and tested formula. I would far rather see a flawed, ambitious image than yet another chocolate box one. Cameras today bear little relation to ones even 10 years ago, let alone 20 or 30. Is it easier now? Undeniably, you can photograph at greater speed, with better clarity, and at times of day previously considered inconceivable. But it is still no cakewalk, and animals today are just as accomplished at refusing to oblige. But even on the rare occasions you get it right, remember it is just a photograph. 
The other day I read some pious photo pilgrim post that he was not a photographer, he was a capturer of light. Please, I'll tell you what he is. When you spend time in these priceless parcels of land with our high density of predators and other signature species, you realize that your camera can become superfluous against your own senses. But sometimes, just sometimes, there are moments that arrive when the ducklings, or indeed cheetahs or lions, all line up. This is rarely by coincidence. Firstly, you need to do your research. You need a proper vehicle with no problem driving off-road and critically not be harnessed by clinical timetables and opening times. This is where these conservancies score top marks. Also, you mustn't feel affronted at rising early, but actually want to get up early, rudely early. You have to know your camera, but not be a slave to it and have patience, bags of it. Most importantly, you need qualified, local, seasoned sorcerers as your guides. One who understand every acre, every rock, tree, and blade of oak grass as if it was their backyard, which of course it is. These are the magicians that find you wildlife when your eyes say there's nothing there. You get all of that right and you have a chance. But even if nothing happens, it's not the worst place to find yourself, knowing that a huge chunk of what any tourist pays here supports so many two-legged and four in these vital wildlife havens. Chris, Megan, the scoring's down to you. But that elusive faunal nirvana photograph will always remain elusive. There are plenty of perfect tens in nature, just not on megapixels, as nature intended. What a beautiful film. It's like cinematic, the way that Paul's composed that. I mean, he's done a really great job. And the vision, like the visuals of that. I know, great photographs, right great photographs, great film put together by Daniel Clarkson, Beyond Africa Films. Dan, thanks so much for working so hard on that. It is yeah. truly, truly beautiful. But now the moment of truth, Paul Goldstein has offered us three photographs to um, have a look at, a critical look at. Let's have a look at the first one. Mm, slow pan leopard. Yeah. About I mean, 15th of a second, 8th of a second maybe. It's nice. I'll hold my hands up. I don't have a photograph like it. It's a hard photograph to get. Obviously the eyes are sharp there, that intensity, that blue eye. Mm. It does have a bit of a green twig in front of it though. It's, it's it? arse has got some green foliage in front of it. I'm not happy with that at all. And no. Paul is one of these people who's very <laughs> honest with his photos. He wouldn't remove that using a you know, Photoshop program. We would. <laughs> yeah, I would. I'd get yeah, rid I of it. I just, just think, I don't want that grass there. I've yeah. got a nice picture of a, a leopard head pin sharp. Grass on the arse. And that's not what you want. <laughs> you want uh, go on, on the then. Points out of ten for his leopard. I like it one. I do love these kind of movement shots because I know how hard they are to get. So I'm going to give this one... A 5.5. 5.5? Mm. Ridiculous. What, with all of the mm. greenery, with all the herbage, well, the I foliage just, around mm. the backside. The position of the leopard is lovely. <sighs> 1.2, moving 1. on. 1.2. 1.2, moving oh. on. Next one. Ah, oh, look at okay. that. The storm there, the perspective of that elephant. It is a good photo. Low angle, wide angle lens, close to the animal, holding it down out the side of the vehicle, mm. close to the ground. But unfortunately, the elephant has farted out a rainbow. <laughs> There's a great orange glow. It's almost like someone's ignited the flatulence of the elephant. And that is quite a powerful flatulence. Um, the other thing, I mean, we're only saying being this picky because Paul's a very good friend of ours. Um, is the horizon straight? Oh, you Ooh. think it's a little bit low on the left? I think it might be a little bit low on the left. Lovely Where sky, lovely sky. Go on mean. Points, points, I do points. like this one. I do like this one. I, I'm going to give it a 4.5. Ridiculous. OK, this one again, I think on account of the ignition, I'm going to give it a couple of points for the flatulence ignition. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to give it, yeah, 2.8. Uh, 2.8. Paul hasn't named that photo. I hope it's going to be called ignition. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, it's time for one more. Let's have a look at this. Uh, this is one of my favourites, actually. I really like it. Obviously, you've got the contrasted patterns there of the black and white of the zebra, but that movement, it is just gorgeous. And to get a pin sharp one right in the middle... With all the others passing. I mean, it looks like it's in a river, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. It does. The only, the only thing about the, it... Oh, the only. Um, it, it, ..is the kind of the tree behind. 
I, you know, it could, it, you know, it's yeah. Pinch up. It, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, this is, is you it see, black, I mean, we're being particularly fussy. No, listen, that. listen, if this were mine, I'd get straight on the Lightroom, I'd darken that down, I'd fuzz that out so there was less detail, I'd get rid of all of those highlights in the background there. I'd get rid of I'd the green. mess with it big time using the pixels, to be quite honest with you. But that's because we're creative liars when it comes to photography. Oh, no, we're <laughs> honest about it. We're, yeah, we're honest, honest about the fact we manipulate photos sometimes. But it's in order to create a work of art, there's, there's two different types of photography, isn't there? You can take a photo like Paul does, which is accurately beautiful, it depicts everything about the environment and that's a stunning piece of work and then you can be a little bit more manipulative about it and kind of create more of a well Paul's is artwork too but it's a bit more yeah you know yeah. What, I don't know what the word is I know what you, you mean know, with contrived. a bit of a paintbrush yeah. contrived yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. okay but you didn't get Paul's any points good. out of uh, 10 for the zebra I'll give six no 6.5 6. 6.5 6. well, massive score yeah. Is Massive it? score. Well, it is, yeah. I'm going to give that one a 5.5. <laughs> but I would recommend that you go to Paul Goldstein's website and look at some of his photographs. He's got some, he's got some nines. He's got a couple of nines. One of a whale's tail disappearing under the water recently that he took. One of a polar bear on a beach. Honestly, when I saw it, I broke down in tears and wept for a week. It's that good. Yeah, we have been particularly mean, but he is a phenomenal photographer and a, a phenomenal guy as well. All the details about where you can find Paul's photographs and Kachechi camp are now in the chat so click on those if you fancy a visit to that conservancy where you too could follow in the footsteps of him and try and emulate his photographic skills he's not the only great photographer we know though is he no we, well, we know quite a few but this one is pretty remarkable it's matt, matt moran. moran matt moran we met him during the south isolating bird club days in 2019 he was following a family of foxes in london and he's kept up with those foxes they're living in uh, an urban area obviously oh look He's got some fantastic film of them. So he films as well as photographs, and he kept a remarkable diary of these animals. There they are with their cubs, look at that. It was very special, isn't it, to get those kind of perspectives. And I know Matt took a long time to get to know these foxes individually. They felt quite calm in his presence. He was able to get these kind of you know, photos and, and, and images. It's so special to see this, because this is not the kind of interaction you see very often, even though they are in the hearts of our cities. I love that one. I love that yeah. shot. That was great, wasn't it? It is beautiful, beautiful. A lot of dedication and hard work went into this project. He's a, a very good kind of photojournalist, I think, getting people not only to appreciate the beauty of foxes, but to understand more about them and to perhaps to respect them that little bit more. Which brings us neatly to this sumptuous book, which he has produced with Neil Aldridge and Andy Parkinson. They're all great photographers and they've come together and they've asked a number of people to write essays about the fox. And they've been very honest about it because as it says here, you know, it can be a neighbor, it can be perceived as a villain and it can be perceived as an icon. So within the uh, book here, we have a celebration of foxes. There's no question about that beautiful photographs where clearly you're exploring the beauty of the animals and here look there we are in a neighborhood situation but there are others where you know the fox is being unfortunately killed on the side of the road and even pictures of fox hunting here so oh blimey i'm in there's that one there, there's me look giving the sabs a break um that's me campaigning obviously against fox hunting but uh, there are other pictures here where are they let's have a look it's bound to be some hunting pictures it's a hard one isn't it because it's so we, we so deem an animal that's successful to be a nuisance sometimes um, and just because something has been part of our past, fox hunting obviously is deemed as a tradition by many, it doesn't necessarily mean it's ethically part of our future. We have to update our practices, update our traditions with modern knowledge and um, this book kind of goes into detail about you know, what happens on a fox hunt. There's some amazing stuff there that you can kind of learn about and I've appreciate got, foxes I've, that I've got to be more. very honest with you. You know, if there's one thing that I would like to see finished before I die, it's fox hunting. I don't, I, I, I dislike things. I, I, I don't manifest the energy to hate anything. I think it's a wasteful emotion. It can lead to all sorts of problems, hatred, but I hate fox hunting. I absolutely hate it. I want it to stop. Yeah, I've got really to just be honest nasty. about that. Look, this beautiful book, we've got three signed copies and this is a chance for you to win one of those signed copies. So I'm going to ask you a very easy question about foxes. The, first, say easy. the first three people that we see, remember it's the people that we see, in the chat giving the right answer will win one of these books signed by all three of the authors and photographers. There we are. It's a lovely book. It certainly is. And the question is, how many teeth has a fox got? How many teeth has a fox got? Answers in the chat. First ones we see. You get the book. No googling. No, no cheating. Googling. All right. No googling. You know we can't see, but we will, we will. Well, we won't know, but don't do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm quite envious of everyone that wins that book. It is really pretty spectacular.
Now over to something a little bit different. When we think of plants, sometimes we think of how they get their energy. They get their energy from photosynthesis, from sunlight, from nutrients in the soil. But we certainly don't expect them to get their energy from this. Now, if the goshawk's the terminator of the bird world, then this has got to be the Ridley Scott alien of the plant world. It's called the Puya chilensis. I've probably said that wrong because I'm terrible with Latin, but basically it's found on dry slopes in Mexico and it's been known that farmers throughout history have burnt this as soon as they've seen it growing in their fields. Why? Well, here's a clue. It's more informal name is the sheep eating plant. Yes, 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 you heard it right. The sheep eating plant. Go with me on this. It's adapted to have these long barbed thorny leaves that basically get tangled up in sheep's fur. The sheep gets trapped, it starves, eventually dies, decays, and the nutrients from that sheep sinks or, for want of a better word, permeates through the soil and the plant then absorbs that nutrients up. Pretty, pretty cool. Now, there's a bit of controversy of whether this is an official carnivorous plant because with other official carnivorous plants, such as Nepenthes and Saracenia, they have enzymes that digest their prey once they've caught it. And to be fair, Nepenthes raja in Borneo has been known to eat mammals as big as rats. Pretty cool. But you could argue, I suppose, that it's just an accident that a sheep gets tangled up in those thorny leaves and it's not actually going out to kill them. However, you'd have to do a sort of experiment to weigh up whether uh, plants that have eaten sheep have grown better, stronger, developed more than those that haven't. And then that would dictate whether they are actually out eating sheep. But whether they are or not, it's still cool. And I mean, I don't have the vocabulary range of Chris, but all I've got to say is this plant is badass. It is. Now, over to a film by Anishwa, who's an amazing young naturalist and environmentalist with Darren Naish, who's a paleontologist with a collection of 6,000 dinosaur models. Over to you guys. Hello. Hi there, good to see you. Good to see right. you too. Come in, follow me. And you've got a Tasmanian tiger. And you've got a leafy sea dragon. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. If you want to have a Jurassic World fan, uh, you already got him. <laughs> I like Jurassic Park. I'll say that. <laughs> Jurassic Park is a bit old fashioned for me. Old fashioned? Is this a velociraptor over here? Yes, yeah, that's a velociraptor uh... made by a company called Safari. Why did you collect all of these models and figures? I was first given a few animal toys as a little kid and I thought they were really interesting, really fun and I started collecting them. And most people, they don't get to keep them because their parents chuck them away or, or whatever. I kept them and for me, my interest in collecting figures is part of my broader interest in animals in general. And how many figures do you have in total? I tried to count them. It's probably going to be somewhere around about 6,000, so that's not that big a collection. <laughs> it's pretty big for me. <laughs> what is your favourite group of models here? As a collector, one of the things that we really like is when a company has made a set of figures and you're able to get them all. And for that reason, there's a set of dinosaurs. They're behind you on a shelf up there. They're called the Beasts of the Mesozoic Horned Dinosaurs set. I'm also a big fan of a vintage range that were made by the Natural History Museum in London during the 70s and 80s. They're called the Invicta range. Again, it sort of gives you a thrill as a collector that you've managed to catch them all. So why do all of these dinosaurs look totally different? Like that T-Rex and that T-Rex over there. They are the same species, but they look totally different. Over the last kind of five decades or so, our view of what these animals were like has changed a lot. And if you go back to a certain time, people were making model dinosaurs and they didn't really care what they looked like. It was just, we know it's meant to be a dinosaur like Tyrannosaurus, but it's just like a, a big lizardy thing with jagged teeth. Like you, that. Yeah, like that. So you could say that's 
that's only roughly what a Tyrannosaurus is like. It's the wrong body shape, it's everything about its proportions are wrong. Whereas if you look at modern figures, like this really excellent example, you can see that the people who made this went to a lot of trouble to get everything right as best as they could. So we now, we now know so much about the anatomy of these animals that modern figures are often very technically accurate. And is there one or a group of figures that you haven't got what you really, really want? There's, I mentioned the uh, Beast of the Mesozoic horned dinosaur range. They have just released a Tyrannosaur range, but they've also done, I think it's something like 20 other Tyrannosaurs. Now I'm a scientist who works on Tyrannosaurs. I published a new kind of Tyrannosaur from England called Eotyrannus in 2001, and they've made an Eotyrannus figure. So for me, that's a holy grail. That's like, I need that figure. I must have that figure. And all your colleagues, what do they think of your gigantic model collection? I would say that the, um, the answer there varies a lot from one person to another. I'm sure there are some who think it's very childish and quite silly, but there's others who value this as an example of how our changing views on dinosaurs are reflected in in artwork. We know that dinosaur toys are really important culturally, they're really important in teaching people about science, in getting people used to science and people learning about animals. So imagine if there was a bad scenario with your house. It caught fire. Mm. You have one last time to choose one of these figures. Which one would it be? If it has to be one and only one, then I probably would grab the very first one I got, which is a toy giraffe from the late 1970s. It was given to me by my grandmother when I was about four years old. It's probably the cornerstone, the sort of like first part of the collection, so it would probably be that one. I had a giraffe just like that made by Britain's models. And your mum's a bit older. I got mine at some point, I would say, in the mid-1960s. And I know exactly where it is. It's up in the loft. I'm tempted to go up there, dig it out, and take it round to Darren. What a bloke. Fantastic. A paleontological polymorph, Darren Nash. Absolutely fantastic. And Anishwa, great ambassador. Check him out. His details are in the chat. Follow Anishwa. He's been up to so much good stuff, really communicating for young people. Getting back to Darren, though, he's got a load of books out. Here's one that I've got of his. It's Mesozoic art. It's all about dinosaurs and uh, their representation, not in you know 3D sculptural form like those models, but in art. But he's got another one out at the moment called Ancient Sea Reptiles which is uh, a fantastic book if you're into the, those sorts of things. And he also runs a conference, and it's taking place at the beginning of December. It's called Tet Zoo. It's in London this year, and you can sign up to that. And again, the details for that will be in the chat. Thank you very much, Darren, for, uh, for doing all of that for us and letting us inside and see those models. I have to say, I went along that afternoon um, to help with the filming, and I spent most of my time just peering into those cabinets, lusting after those models. Some of them were absolutely sensational. Anyway, now it's time for Chrysia to climb aboard the soapbox. The soapbox is a little bit different, but it's something that's important to me. It's about connecting with nature from birth. It takes one generation to reconnect with nature. I believe that this relation with nature needs to start from birth. I've learned this through my son, Zuri. Black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth and pregnancy. These figures are shocking and I want to change this narrative. The idea of birth being scary and painful is normalised. I believe that our lack of knowledge around women's bodies manifest in not knowing our bodies and trusting them. My experiences using holistic practices was positive. I had a lotus birth keeping the placenta attached until it falls off naturally, using herbs, salts, and drying it out. It's thought to help with a natural and peaceful transition from the womb to the world. My work aims to build a connection from birth. With toddlers and babies, I use sensory experiences like touching, tasting, and grounding barefoot. With children and families, the power of being in nature brings a sense of belonging. 
I've won workshops for them where we do things like nature art, moth trapping and tree hugging. I also work with teens and young people running camps in nature and growing foods from scratch. Seeing the satisfaction of them eating the things that they grew is what it's really about. As you can see, consistently engaging with nature grows our bond for a lifetime. I'll be doing a new project around connecting with our natural world through holistic practices for families, young mums, single mums and children. I'm raising some money to make it a reality. By donating to my crowdfunder, you'll be making these experiences happen. Thank you, Chrisia. Powerful and important stuff there. And the crowdfunder is something that we should all think about supporting. Mental health difficulties have increased enormously across all sectors of society, but particularly with those people who are locked in the inner cities and don't have access to nature. We know that nature can be so healing, particularly when it comes to raising happy and healthy families. And that's what Chrisia wants to do with this crowdfunder. So the link is in the chat. If you click on that, you can make donations. And what she's going to be doing is a whole raft of different things within these communities. Blogs, vlogs, events, uh, uh, workshops, all sorts of different things. And there are a number of things we've got on offer. We've chucked a few things in here. So we've got one of these uh, 8 out of 10 back cards that we've had made, signed by everyone that's been presenting that. And we We've got some mugs, yeah, some more of the mugs. So if you've missed them in the quiz because you weren't fast enough with Susie Dent or Judy Dench's words, then you could get one by making a donation to that crowdfunder. That would be fantastic. As I said before, link is in the chat right now. Now, Henry Morris, author of The Secret Royal, which we've been enjoying greatly behind the scenes here, um, has been an alter ego for us. Last week was giving a party political broadcast. He's also been Barry Sludge, a sewage operative, trying to squirm out of the mess that the water companies have been making of our rivers and seas. But now he's becoming Professor Steve Hydrocarbon, making excuses for the fossil fuel giants who are setting fire to our world. Take it away, Steve. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just leave the engine running so we can get to the pub straight after. Good evening. Since at least the 1970s, oil companies have known about the causes of global warming. That's why we spend $200 million a year lobbying to block and delay green policies. I'm Professor Steve Hydrocarbon, and I've been paid £50,000 to appear in this video. Historically, tanker disasters, human rights abuses, war, and driving the planet to the brink of uninhabitability have kept us in the headlines. But there have been bad times too, like in 1998, when we only made a quarter of a trillion dollars. We understand that people use fossil fuels for all sorts of reasons, for people who don't have a choice because we're blocking green innovation, to Christians who are just trying to burn the evidence. Due to the woke laws of physics, the planet is warming inexorably, and in the past, we lied about this. Then we said global warming was just a theory. Then we emphasised the uncertainty. Then we engaged in economic scaremongering. Then we said it's your fault, not ours. Then we did greenwashing. And now we're saying we're part of the solution. Because remember, if sales dry up, we might have to lay off a few MPs. That's why we're introducing our new reward scheme. Tipping points. For every trillion we make between now and the end of the planet, we will sponsor a polar bear. For every billion in tax we dodge, we will hire a bent scientist. And for every thousand miles you do in your car, we will give you a 10 pound military hardware voucher. Remember, we can only continue to make obscene amounts of money if you keep believing everything's going to be fine. We are big oil, and in between fighting over clean water sources with local militias, your children will clear up our mess. Paul. Oh, what about that? I love Henry Morris. He's so funny. He brings like a real comedic element to something that is very serious and needs to be spoken about, but it's quite refreshing to have those kind of issues communicated about in that type of way. I'm sat here, I've had to lower my voice. We've left a gap on the sofa. I said the sofa, the hay bales here. Because one of our special guests seems to have unloaded himself right next to us. I'm in the danger zone right now. Um, but we are going to talk about these two very special little owls. So George, who have you got? 
So this is Fagan. So he's a little owl. He's three years old. He is roughly 20 centimetres tall. He's got a wingspan of 55 centimetres. So to Ethel a couple of days ago, he's a light snack. He's basically. beautiful, isn't he? Look at the colour of his Gorgeous. eyes. Gorgeous. Beautiful. So yeah, it's a species called little owl. And little owls aren't actually native to the UK. They were introduced in the 1800s to parts of the south of England. But unlike most species that are non-native, they don't really have much of an impact. Uh, and that's due to mainly owls filling a kind of niche. So these guys will tend to eat some small mammals, uh, but mainly earthworms and beetles. And you'll often find little beetle wings in the pellets. And the Dung Beetle UK Mapping Project, which is abbreviated to DUMP, which is appropriate seeing as it's about dung beetles, um, have shown that potentially four dung beetles have gone extinct in the last 50 years, and that corresponds with an 18% decline in little owls since 1995, which shows that these guys are really good indicators of the health of our ecosystems. Yeah. Isn't it gorgeous? Oh, beautiful. they're so beautiful. They're really hard yeah. to see in the wild as well. More yeah, common they? in England and Scotland, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. You know, I, I think yeah. I've seen one through a through some binoculars once, or a couple actually, yeah. they were kind of nestled in together, but to see them like this is oh, loving a head scratch it. too. Loves a good little head scratch, don't you? Right. Well, you're having a proper bonding moment there, George. Yeah, I know, I think you might be coming back to Stirling with me. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right, well, yeah. Let's so, yeah, see what your hauls think about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, here, tell me about your, um, your owl that you have. So, what we, we have Floki here, who's four years old, and of course, barn owl, you can see, famously known for beautiful, beautiful colour, but I guess when people see him or his species flying above, you know, they often say it's the squeak owl or the ghost owl. I don't know much about barn owls. I know that's your favourite owl, so could you tell me a bit more about it? It's my favourite bird in the whole world, the <laughs> barn owl. I don't know, there's something about them. I mean, Floki, has, Floki here is they're kind of looking around. I mean, it's just Floki's first time with the light, so he's doing really, really well. But he's such a special bird. I mean, barn owl's known, obviously, for nesting in barns, old historic buildings, which is part of the reason why we're seeing a decline in the UK of this species, because we are wrecking, pulling down those old buildings which these barn owls used to roost and nest in. But the other reason why they're, they're declining so significantly is because whilst barn owls can be found all around the world, they have a really wide distribution. In the UK, they're at the most northernmost point of their range, so the weather impacts that they feel here... <laughs> <laughs> I have a little look. Super curious. Um, are the most extreme of any of the population in the world. So they're really suffering from increased precipitation, increased rainfall. What are you doing? What are you doing? Um, increased rainfall because, of course, these birds have to be silent. And when there's a lot of rain, they really struggle to hunt. Um, their feathers can become waterlogged. That makes them a lot heavier, so they're less successful in hunting prey. Um, it means also it's a lot louder for them because they're so reliant upon sound to catch their prey things like voles and mice that then they can't actually hear their prey because the, the rain is so loud um, so they're beautiful I think there's something really charismatic around them mm. do you know what I think really stands out yeah like, his face is very like prominent the kind of disc if you want to say facial disc yeah around I love what he's doing. He's like he's dancing. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the reason why they, all owls have a facial disc, or not so much here on our, on our little owl, but slightly, is all about sound waves. So the sound, in. yeah, it comes in and it kind of, the, this facial disc bounces the sound waves off and directs the sound waves into their ear. So mm. as he's moving around, he's trying to get all the sound and the light going in. And look at that movement. It just goes how, to show how flexible they are. Mm. Look at that. Proper curious. <laughs> Beautiful birds. Gosh. He's a little lighter than... Then Yoda, the tawny owl, yeah. Yeah, but I must say, cute factor is beyond. Okay. I'll choose. I think I'll I'll choose him over Yoda. Uh, over the tawny owl. Yeah, Yoda's. Uh, I'm so sorry, Yoda. I hope you can't hear oh, you me. Switched allegiance. Yeah. Floki's <sighs> won my heart. George, what about you? Eagle owl, little owl. Well, I can certainly say my arm is less achy than when I was holding <laughs> Ethel. Definitely, but uh, I do think. Me and Fagan are having a little moment here. Yeah, I can t I can yeah. tell that. Heart to heart. Yeah, it's me? feeling quite gorgeous. Quite sweet, isn't it? Oh, yeah, and that wasn't the first heart to heart I had either. I was very, very lucky to meet an extremely friendly badger a couple of days ago. Ah, she was she was gorgeous on the film. Now I've been told of a very, very friendly badger here at the site, so I'm going to meet up with Matt and we're going to go and feed her. Can't wait. Yes, let's go and meet Blossom. Oh, can't wait. 
can't wait. Okay, after you. That's cracking, thank you. Come on, Blossom. Hello, gorgeous. Blossom. And what's the sort of history here at the park? She came to us as a rescue and when she was a cub, she unfortunately got hit on the road by a car. Oh, okay. And it explains that very distinctive yeah. curve in her nose, that bent in her nose. Um, wasn't in a good shape and a rescue centre looked after her, reconstructed all of that. Uh, but because of the amount of extra attention she had, it meant she became, well, this friendly. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't, wasn't wild enough to be released with their other ones okay. and so they needed a permanent home for her. Right. And we were very happy to offer her a home <laughs> here. Absolutely. Very often you can hand feed a badger, blimey. No, you'd never be able to get as close to this for a while, would you? Oh, yeah, no, of course. And then you keep her separate from the main sort of set of badgers, as well. Yes, right? yeah, uh, we tried to introduce her with our main clan when she first arrived, but they can be very difficult, very temperamental sometimes, and, and she was fine, she was loving it, but our established group just didn't take to her, yeah. and if that happens, they can get very, very aggressive. So we've kept her separate, but since we have found her a couple of other rescues that needed a home, so she's got her own family now. Oh, lovely. <laughs> the end in there. <laughs> and what's her diet here? We mainly feed her the dog biscuit you've got there and some tin dog food mixed in as well. Oh, a good bit of grub. Yeah, I mean, out in the wild, uh, it'll mainly be earthworms. Mainly good, earthworms. Good 50% of their diet will be earthworms. You're looking at about 200 earthworms a night for a badger. Really? It's a staggering wow. amount, really. And especially with wet weather like this, I'm sure they'll be finding some of that yeah. here naturally as well, our ones. Of course. No, I'll tell you what, there's uh, no way you'd get this close to a badger in the wild. No, no it's amazing. All. You know, even just looking at the fur here, you can just see the different tones of grey. You know, yeah. that you wouldn't normally appreciate seeing badgers in the wild. And, and it's quite coarse, isn't it? It it's is. Not, it's, it's not very a soft coarse. fur, it's yeah. a coarse fur. Very coarse. Very noisy eaters as well. <laughs> yes, that's the set. I tell you what, I'm going to be telling anyone who will listen that I've got to hand feed a badger. I mean, just how special is that? I mean, whenever you see badgers out in the wild, there are fleeting glimpses, but to get that close, never going to forget it. But when they said that I got the chance, got the opportunity to talk about badgers, that's all right. But when they said I could talk about my badges, now we're talking. I'm going to give you a little whistle stop tall. Whistle stop tour of my badges by popular demand. So, starting at the top here, we've got white tailed eagle, stone roses, sex pistols, let that ragger drop the clash, yellow submarine the beetles, specials, red grouse, osprey, great crested grebe, the clash, rolling stones, kingfisher, the smiths. And on side two, we have got SIBC, uh, Sergeant Pepper, the beetles, oasis. The Clash, Peregrine Falcon, Green Blue Peter Badge, Black Grouse, The Jam, and of course, The White Poppy. And how could I forget the exclusive, the brilliant, the best thing you will see this autumn, the 8 out of 10 Bat Badge. Extremely limited edition, rarer than Bittens, rarer than Steak, I don't know, rarer than the rarest thing you could even think of. You need to get them. Midnight tonight... Gone, done, you need to buy now. Not later, now, buy now. I've got my director in my ear saying, sell, 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 turn into Alan Sugar, you need to buy them now. Right this second, get on your computers, buy the 8 out of 10 Bats badge. Now we're going to go and calm down a little bit now, and we're going to head over to Leif and Quezia, who are going to talk to us a little bit about leaves. Thanks, George. We're, we've seen some amazing animals here at the British Wildlife Centre this week. We've seen foxes, we've seen badgers, we've seen otters, we've seen owls. But Questia and I thought we'd better readdress the balance a bit and uh, talk about some of our green friends instead. Yeah, because they're often overlooked, right? Everyone kind of just like overlooks plants and just thinks All the time. they're not like anything special, but they really are. And we went out today and thought, let's see what we can find here at British Wildlife Centre. Um, as you can see there, we found quite a variety of different leaves. It's amazing, isn't it? You think, you know, November is not a time people generally think of looking at plants, but this is just an extraordinary diversity of different shapes and sizes, uh, textures, as I found out. <laughs> um, I picked that thistle, thistle leaf down at the bottom there and regretted it immediately, I have to say. Um, got stung by the stinging nettle as well. Um, <laughs> But isn't it amazing what diversity we can find if we just stop and stop and look? Honestly, um, the beauty of of the different leaves as well, as you as you saw there, that you had like the arrow, 
you had so many different different shapes and sizes and we actually managed to see some rosettes as well so that was really something special yeah they're again just so beautiful that sort of whole plant um, is really really extraordinary as well and um, i love one, one thing i love is having like a repeated pattern but lots of different kinds yeah and um, so i really enjoyed putting these together sort of things like uh, river plantain and dandelions and um, some cabbage species as well so yeah so lots to look at if you just start the, the rosettes, I guess, are a spiral of leaves, and the way that they grow is flat as well, mm. which just shows how adapted to like the environment they've been. Because often, you know, people are trodden, and you know, mammals, humans, like we often are stepping on plants. And just to see how the plants have adapted and just learnt to grow wide and flat rather mm. than up, it's just yeah. so interesting. It is, isn't it? In those sort of downtrodden places like gateways and along paths and things um, where they get constantly walked over by people and, and driven over as well. It's, uh, they don't get damaged. They're fine. Now, you know, you might be dismissing some of these plants as being weeds, particularly in November, but they're all really, really special. They've all got names. They've all got medicinal uses. They've all, some of them are edible and they've got stories associated with them. And I think that's really, really magical. And so we thought we'd show you uh, four of the species that we managed to find earlier. First off, we have the plantain, which is the broadleafed one. Um, and with the broadleaf plantain, it's really, really, really good and used for burns or... Uh, like stinging nettles for stings, bites, because you can actually chew it a bit and get a pulp and actually put on that sting or bite. And funny enough, it's, it's, it's said that broadleaf does that, but that's actually a placebo effect. It's, this is actually the true, true thing that you need whenever you get a bite or a sting, the plantain. Yeah, don't worry about those dock leaves, get straight on the plantains. <laughs> um, we also have yarrow. Uh, yarrow is one of my favourite plants. It produces those sort of white uh, flowers in that platform that often flowers long into uh, the autumn and the winter. Um, they have these really, really beautiful feathery leaves, really, really finely divided. Um, absolutely extraordinary. And these can be used to make a tea. Um, so literally just pick a few leaves, put some hot water over them. Um, they can also be used to um, staunch bleeding. So again, like Sia said, if you just make a little pulp, uh, chew them a little bit and then apply it to a wound, it'll stop it bleeding. Um, and yeah, all sorts, of, all sorts of uses for this like roadside plant. It's amazing. <laughs> Next off, we have the clover. Um, a lot of the time, obviously, we associate the free leaves. And on its stem, you can actually, you can actually tell what clover it is because we have the white clover or red clover. And depending if there's spikes on its stem is how you'll be able to differentiate between the red and the white one. You can actually use this also for tea. You can actually use it for some people, women, in fact, to use it for menopause and asthma, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's useful to know for the future. If I can get <laughs> um, and then we've got our dandelion. Um, I love dandelions. Um, they're one of the best plants and they should be in everyone's lawn. Um, now, the dandelion leaves can be used uh, in salads. It can be used kind of in the same way as you use spinach. So you might have it in pastas and things as well. Um, but they're brilliant. They're full of vitamins, loads and loads of vitamin C in there. So they're absolutely brilliant for your immune system. Um, now, the name dandelion comes from the French dent de lion, uh, which means lion's teeth. And you can see uh, just along the edge of the leaf here, these sort of toothed bits, which kind of look like lion's teeth. You might have to amuse your imagination a little bit. Um, but weirdly, while we call it dandelion, and it's called some variation of dandelion all across Europe, in France, where that name originated, uh, they call it pissenlit, which means wet the bed. <laughs> This might sound bizarre. I find it hilarious that it's called uh, wet the bed in France, but this is because they have diuretic properties as well. So if you eat the leaves, um, you're more likely to want to pee. It's wonderful what these plants are, um, what we found. You can find them anywhere as well. I guess go outside, you know, check your pavements. Like, don't just dismiss plants and think that they're not anything special because they are. They have many uses, like some of the ones that we've discussed today. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Next, we're going to go and hear from 13-year-old Andy Symes. Andy won the Junior Science 2023 category in the finals of the UK Big Bang Science and Engineering competition with his project, Which Bird Food is the Most Popular? Let's see how he did it. Recently, I did a study on birds for a science award. I decided to look at bird feeding habits by recording visits to my garden bird feeder. 
The aim of the study was to find which bird food was the most popular. Breeding birds throughout the year is very important because it helps them to survive the winter and gives them enough fat and protein to stay warm. In nesting season, it gives them enough food to feed the chicks. It is very important to have a good variety of bird food to encourage a wide variety of birds. And now it is more important than ever as many birds are suffering declines in population. This is most likely due to climate change, habitat loss, bird flu, and it's also closely linked to the rapid decline in insect populations, which are a vital food source for many birds. The bird foods that I made available were fat balls, peanuts, sunflower seeds, and niger seeds. I did the study in December when natural food is at its most scarce. I recorded each visit to the feeders for one half hour period in the morning and another half hour in the afternoon over five days. I'm lucky to live in an Northumberland village with a deciduous woodland next to the garden, which is a great habitat for a variety of birds. My hypothesis was that fat balls would be the most popular in winter as they are packed with calories which will help them survive the cold. Where, where I live sometimes gets as cold as minus 10 degrees Celsius, so I always think how amazing it is that tiny birds can survive at all when humans would struggle without warm houses. This graph shows the results for the morning across the whole five days. As you can see, blue tit visited the most at 70 visits on the sunflower seeds followed by the great tit and then the coal tit. The birds that visited less were the robin, jackdaw, goldfinch, sparrow, chaffinch, nuthatch, dunnock and greater spotted woodpecker. The most visited birds' food was the sunflower seeds, then followed by the peanuts, then fat balls. The niger seeds had no visits at all. The afternoon was a lot more quiet as the blue tit only visited the sunflower seeds 15 times and some birds didn't even visit the bird food at all. My prediction was wrong as sunflower seeds were the most popular, not fat balls. I think this is that the sunflower seeds were a lot easier for the birds to get as the fat balls were hard for the birds to pick apart. An exception to this was when the jackdaws came and they ripped apart the fat balls and sometimes even damaged the bird feeder. During the study, the niger seeds did not get any visits at all. Though if I had done the study in the summer, the results would be very different, as bird feeding habits vary with the seasons. For example, in the spring, we had a large number of siskins eating niger seeds, even though I didn't see any during the winter. Even birds which don't use the bird feeder can benefit as pigeons, blackbirds and thrushes can usually be found underneath, picking up the seeds dropped from above. When you attract small birds to your garden, you sometimes attract larger ones too, as this unfortunate blue tit found when it was predated by a sparrowhawk in my garden. Though I am aware that bird feeding should be done carefully, as while it can help some rarer birds, it may also artificially boost the populations of some common birds like blue tits. Though I think more research needs to be done on this. Birds aren't just found in the garden, they can be found in almost any environment. That's why I often take my camera out to see what I can find. In conclusion, anyone can do a study like this. And personally, I learned a lot about garden bird feeding habits, and it really made me aware of how amazing birds are. Adam Symes.
I salute you. What a top young man there. Brilliant piece of science, did all those observations, wrote it all up, won a junior science prize, and then did all the photography to put that film together, including a sparrowhawk eating a bird on the fence. Adam, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Hope to see you at some point in the future doing something brilliant, maybe academically for the bird world, uncovering more secrets of ornithology. Top work top work. Now, talking of secrets of ornithology, cast your mind back a few hundred years. Migration was an enigma. People didn't know where birds went when they left. Swallows are a classic case in part. They used to think that they hibernated underneath the lakes. Finally, someone came up with the idea of tying little pieces of silk to their legs. And when they came back the following year to their nest, the silk was still there, but it was faded. More recently, of course, we've been fitting aluminium rings to birds' legs. And this tells us where they go to in other parts of the world if we're fortunate enough to catch them or if the birds are unfortunate enough to die and someone picks them up. But we also like watching migration. Viz MIG is big in the bird world. People go to watch birds migrating. And in some places, it can be truly spectacular. You go to places like Gibraltar, you get huge numbers of raptors coming over. And they migrate in the daytime so that you can see them, hence visible migration. But what about all of those smaller birds and other species which migrate at night when it's cooler? and they're not using as much energy, they're not dehydrating, and they're avoiding predators. You can't see those, but there is a way of detecting them, and that's not MIG, nocturnal migration, and measuring that. Now, Mark Constantine is a very avid birder, to say the least, and a few years ago he went to North America, and there they'd already picked up on a new technique to monitor birds migrating at night by listening to them. Here's Mark to explain how he came across that and brought it back to the UK. Now, recording bird sounds at night is not a new thing. It started in the, the 50s. A chap called Traber in Illinois, I think it was Illinois, he, um, he started recording birds at night as part of a study. He then inspired uh, a guy in New York, Bill Evans, that's it. And he did this huge, great dish up on the, on the hills of New York and, and used a VHS machine to record all the birds in an eight hour period. Because he used the VHS because it had eight hours. All the birds that passed over and then he would analyze all of those and work out what birds were passing over New York. Technology has moved on. You don't need a massive dish now to capture the sounds of these birds that are moving overhead at night. You can equip yourself for about £150. That is for a recorder and a microphone. But then you've got to put it somewhere where it can record those birds. Typically, not MIG people put it on top of their conservatories, away from trees, pointing directly upwards. Obviously, you've got to avoid wind and rain, which will spoil the recording. You've got to put it somewhere where it's safe, it's not going to blow off or be stolen. Then you can download some free programs like Audacity, which is available online. You download your recordings into that, and then the tricky bit happens. That's when you've got to try and identify the sounds. And this can be tricky, even for experts like Mark. Now, going back to 2019 during lockdown, he was busily trying to count the number of birds that he could see in his garden and max out on that total. I say see, I also mean hear. Because at night he was laying awake in bed, his wife Mo sleeping beside him. He had the headphones on and he was trying through the night to pick up a few extra species and he thought that he'd heard a heron visiting his garden. But it turned out there was more to it than that. Mark will explain called the sound approach. Um, Arnaud Vandenberg and Magnus Rob are my two friends. Um, so Magnus comes over and he stays with me for a few nights and we go through all the recordings I've made. We go through the recording I made that night, the record night, um, and he then points out what is bleeding obvious. It's not a heron, it's a night heron. It's the first night heron recorded in pool for 50 years. I love that. I love the fact that you can essentially lie in bed and listen or you can just leave the recorder on and you can find species that haven't been in your area for about 50 years using new technologies to uncover more about these birds. Let's have a look now at a sonogram of the call of the night heron. Here it is. It's quite quiet. 
it's distinctive. And once you've got your ear in and you know what that is, then you can identify that and of course a whole range of other species too. And here is the night heron, the bird itself. Now they are relatively frequent visitors to the UK. In fact, they've bred here, I think, for a while. They escaped from, escaped from Edinburgh Zoo. And they were always hanging around in Abilene Bay. I remember seeing one there. Um, they're not regular breeders though, so still really nice to see those night herons. But it wasn't just that night heron, because once Mark had got stuck into this, other people climbed on board. He opened uh, the idea to lots of other people, and a community of not miggers began to build. And here's Mark to tell us more about how this has grown. What happened during that same period was my friend here in Poole, who I, I uh, founded with, uh, with him, Birds of Poole Harbour, he, um, he started to get the bug. He then put a recorder above our offices down here and he picked up an even sort of more special bird in a way, and more special than night heron, well, certainly not expected. He picked up a passage of Waterland buntings. Nick Hopper, another colleague, he then went down to Portland. He found that them migrating over there by recording it at night. OK, so now we're starting to get quite well known for this bizarre, bizarre sort of behaviour. And, uh, and we've done a website, just a sound approach website, and you're welcome, very welcome to use it. And this starts to turn into a sort of resource for everyone. And, and then other people throughout Britain start to pick up the habit of recording things at night and seeing what happens. Ortolan bunting. Now, let me tell you, these birds are, of course, breeding species in Europe, but the idea that they would ever be migrating over the UK was just impossible. No one would ever see them. No viz mig. This was only discovered when knock mig took off. And of course, once they spotted Ortolans in one place, they started to find them in all sorts of other places using those microphones. Went, Here, let's again take a look at the sonogram of the Ortolan bunting. Very different sound. So in the hands of an expert here, using the shape that is visible on that sonogram, plus the sound itself, you can identify them. And here is an autolum bunting. Now, as I say, they're a bit like a cell bunting, a bit like a yellow hammer, similar type of bird, similar sorts of habitat, but they don't breed in the UK and they were previously unknown as migrants. So this is a, a great discovery that this has brought to us. As I say, not MIG is something that you can get into really easily. There's uh, a lot of information about it online. I looked at some bird guides information this afternoon of how to do it and how to get started. Um, then I would draw your attention to the sound approach and the details of this are in the chat at the moment. This is a, an organisation that Mark has set up with two of his uh, knock MIG colleagues. They produce web guides to bird sound. They are absolutely amazing, I've got to say. If you download them on your device, you can interact with them, tap the screen and the bird song will come out. One of the best ways of learning bird song, without a shred of a doubt, one of them is a, a, a broad spectrum thing. The other one is called Catching the Bug and they've got another one called Undiscovered Owls and I highly recommend these. I say details are in the chat. Now, when we decided to um, start this eight out, of bat, uh, 8 out of 10 bats thing, we reached out to a few young people and said, you know, would you be interested in making some films or maybe coming on, doing a bit of campaigning? And then we got this from Rufus Dawson. Rufus just went and made this off his own back and then sent it to us and said, would you like it? And Rufus not only would we like it, we like it a lot. Rufus went out with his mobile phone and a small camera, and here's his film about wall lizards on Clifton Suspension Bridge. I live in the centre of Bristol, and behind me is Clifton's world-famous suspension bridge. Every day, thousands of tourists and residents come to visit this beautiful bridge, although very few of them will notice that something very special is living on the walls leading up to the bridge. Come with me and I'll show you. So in the rock face behind me, there is a large population of wall lizards. And they are non-native, but they've been introduced to the UK since the Victorian period. They're quite large, they can grow to 20 centimetres, and they were first discovered here in Bristol in 2006. So they've been here for quite a long time. 
No one really knows for sure how they got here, but they can be found on rocks and boulders, and as the name suggests, walls, making the Avon Gorge an excellent habitat for them. Wall lizards lay a clutch of up to 10 eggs, which they bury. So I suppose the big question is, how are they doing so well here in the UK? Well, the answer to that is when wall lizards in the UK lay their eggs, the embryo is much more developed than it is at this stage when they are laying their eggs in Europe. This is an adaptation which has enabled the huge success of wall lizards here in Bristol and in other places in the UK. This is just some of the amazing and diverse wildlife which can be found around Bristol. What a warming clip from Rufus there. Just gave you a bit of a buzz, that. I mean, I'll tell you what, you've taught me something there, because I never even knew that these sort of lizards existed. Yeah, they're beautiful, aren't they? They're really oh, colourful, the males. Yeah, I heard that they're only seen in the southern part of England. Yeah. And it's quite rare to see them. Yeah. Really rare. So, Rufus, you're very lucky to have that kind of interaction with wall lizards. I think we're all a little so bit jealous. Pure. Very jealous. I know you'll have to take me to that spot. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll come around your place, Rufus, yeah, yeah. for a bit of wall lizard fun. Next spring or summer? Yeah. We'll, we'll Get it in your calendar. <laughs> now, of course, every single day we do Skull of the Day, but this is our final one on eight out of ten bats. I can't believe the time has come already. Um, Chris posted the photo, as ever, on his Twitter this morning. And the skull in question for today mm. is this one. What do we think? Looks like his, the beak looks a bit like a shovel, personally. Mm -hmm. mm. That's a good yeah. one. Like it might be yeah. an aquatic kind mm. of... Yeah, some sort of duck, maybe. It's mm. a good one. It's a very good one, yeah. Mm. So the shape of the bill is very prominent. As Quasi said there, it does look quite like a shovel, which is a very, very good clue. Uh, now, the males in breeding season can have this beautiful emerald head. Females tend to be a little bit duller, as usual with mm. birds. Sometimes they're a little bit more brown. Males have all the fun with all the pigment and the colour. Um, but it is a really gorgeous bird, and it does belong to a shoveler. And the person who got that right was Alex Cummingham. So well done, Alex. Well, that was a bit of a hard one, a bit of a tricky mm, yeah. one today. But yeah, pretty nice. Yeah, beautiful skull as well. Anyway, as always, we're going to head over to Susie Dent with the answer to the word of the day. Well, here's my answer to today's teaser. And the question was, what is the door doing in the word dormouse? Well, the answer is it has nothing to do with doorways, as you might expect, and everything we think to do with the French dormir, meaning to sleep, because the dormouse is a very sleepy animal. Ooh, there we go, obviously. Right? Door. Right? Door. Dormir. Sleep. Mm. French. Oui. Oh. Of course. Oui, oui, monsieur. Oui. 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 C'est incroyable. Incroyable. Who won it? One of the two. <laughs> uh, Marion Marsh won that one. Marion Marsh Marian got Marsh. the last mug. The Pound last air. mug. Oh, my goodness me. Marion, I'm going to be sat at my kitchen table wrapping this up in bubble wrap, trying to find something relatively solid to put it in the post and post it to you. Marion, do let us have your address and all of the other winners of mug of the day. <laughs> Sorry, word of the day. <laughs> well, it hasn't always been words. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mug of the day. So it was one of mug. No, it wasn't delivered, was it? Um, um, then please set, make sure we've got your addresses and we'll be posting them out uh, sometime next March. No, I just as soon as we possibly can. And I do promise you I'll make sure he washes them up before he puts them in the post to you as well. Um, what about the books? The books, There was yeah. another prize today, wasn't there? Three of these fantastic books here. So this was Matt Moran, Neil Aldridge and Andy Parkinson's book about foxes. Beautiful photographs, interesting essays as well about the animal. We ask you the question, how many teeth does a fox have? How many teeth does a fox have? Who won? Wow, three people won. Uh, the answer, should we say the answer first? Oh, I guessed at 44, but I was wrong. It was 42, wasn't it? I knew all along. I knew it was 42. Uh, I mean, okay. you know, who doesn't know that kind of thing? Anyway, <laughs> moving on. Uh, so the people who won a copy of this wonderful book is Simon Gray. We've got Matt H and Kelsey Kitty Wake. Oh, so make sure you let us know your addresses as well, because we will get this signed edition of Fox uh, Neighbour Villain Icon in the post to you, because it is 
a brilliant book, an absolutely brilliant book. Right. Fabian Harrison, our live director, is telling me that we must plug uh, the pin badge. Uh, the pin badges are flying after George's prominent advertisement <laughs> earlier. I've watched Wolf of Wall Street one too many times, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> You're not on commission, are you, George? <laughs> uh, anyway, moving well, on. Well, listen, gonna be, there, there'll be no more of these available after midnight tonight. We've just got a few left, if you would like one of these, and they are bigger. They will be bigger than this one. Um, then uh, someone will be posting those out. Uh, do give us a little while, though, because we're obviously obviously not wanting to waste anything so we haven't ordered them until we knew how many were going to be sold so it will take us a little time but you will get your pin badge and the other thing to say though briefly i mean quesia earlier on in your soapbox you were talking about your brilliant campaign getting young kids out and about in nature and we offered, didn't we, a few mugs for £75 and a few signed cards from all the presenters of 8 out of 10 bats for £50. We've only got one mug left and four cards left, so six cards have sold, as well as four mugs. So it's doing really well. Thank you to everyone who's den um, donated. It's been, it's been great, and we'll get that over the post to you soon. But you can still get some, so make sure you're quick on that. Yeah, and the <laughs> links to the crowdfunder are in the chat, and we'll be posting those over the next few days as well. So if you miss your opportunity tonight, please do everything you can to support Quizay on our excellent scheme that's coming up but uh, I say coming up that's pretty much the end yeah. of 8 out of 10 I can't bats. believe it yeah 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 well we thought we'd cut together a short series highlights here we are there's a minute of this hello and welcome to 8 out of 10 bats can you believe it hi hold on to your hats it's going to be a great one <laughs> It's not bad, actually. Oh, yeah. oh, very nice. You don't need scabby thighs <laughs> after extreme goshawk rubbing. Go on. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh that's so cute. Does that actually mean shameless phallus? Do a crisp pack up here. I'll give it a bit, of, a, a bit of a sniff. Making it the longest penis in relation to body size in the animal kingdom. I mean, I don't mean to feel smug, but I feel a little bit smug right now. Oh, 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 That's the spot. But this is so joyous. Right, come on. There you go. Oh. Yes. Yes. Look at that. It's about a duck that. that size. I wouldn't go out. But isn't that cool? I love a parasitoid. Excuse me. Rude. Some beaver chips, a very, very valuable collectible item. So I'm going to kick off with the bird of death. Which was lovingly donated and gifted to me by Mr. Chris Packard. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And when I learned about this, it absolutely blew my mind. Honestly, the smaller things in life are always overlooking it. And they might be looking for some ladies. Mm. Ooh, la. <laughs> look at that, look at this. Whoa. Creepy coolies, mystical stories. That bat. Looks like a bat, right? <laughs> Looks like a bat. <laughs> yeah, you're here. Tufts in the wind. What an amazing show it's been. I can't believe it's gone so quickly. I know I've already said that, but it has been phenomenal to share all these stories of wildlife with you, to have you all join us as well. I mean... We couldn't have asked for much more. 8 out of 10 bats has gone above and beyond what we all imagined it could be. Thank you for your support. And now a vote of thanks for a number of people. Megs, firstly, thanks for everything. And then, of course, Krasia, thank you very much for joining us this week. It's been absolutely fantastic. I hope you've enjoyed it too. George, what can we say? I expect the 100 grand in the post by tomorrow. <laughs> OK, you can expect that. <laughs> and you'll get that at some point in the very, very distant future. Um, <laughs> Indy Green, where's Indy Green? Indy Green, obviously, oh, was oh, presenting with us last week. He's been helping out this week as well. Indy, thanks very much for that. Uh, Christina can't be with us, unfortunately, but uh, we send our thanks to her. Christina Sinclair, thank you very much for coming us. And then Fabian Harrison, come on oh. in, Fabes. The man Absolute, absolute wizard behind all of this, helped put it all together, the technical brains, the live director, the fretter, and I have to say also the brains behind the pin badges and the man who's going to be posting them all out. <laughs> <laughs> Fabian, oh, thanks. Uh, you, no, we just couldn't thank you enough, it's been absolutely brilliant. Well done, but you've got to go back and mix something else yeah, off. Yeah, okay. see you right. later. <laughs> now, our uh, cameraman, we've got Henry Tamblin here, who's given up his time to come and help. Henry, squeeze in. Fantastic, <laughs> thank you very much. Much. Gavin Evans, come over. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And the one and only Peter Troy Elliott, wow. sound man extraordinaire. <laughs> With excellent styles of coats. Excellent yes. styles of coats. <laughs> Here he is. 
formerly one of two men in a boat, in a canoe, <laughs> and also uh, uh, serenading us out last week with his fantastic sang, uh, song, Shine. Mm. Thank you very much, Pete. That was absolutely sensational. But that's not it, is it? That's no. not it at all. We've got the wonderful Lucy Lapwing, who is the prop extraordinaire, as well as James Stevens, who's been our wildlife filmmaker. Come on in, Lucy and James. Uh, they've also been live producing these episodes, so they've done above and beyond and gone all out to kind of bring up these stories together. But it's not just us uh, here as well. We've got, where's Leif for Sweden? Come on, Leif, hey. get in here. <laughs> got wonderful Leif, who's been helping out behind the scenes as well, doing lots of our social media, and of course, doing all the beautiful plant content as you've seen today too. So that's been really great. Charlotte Corney's been sat on her computer at home, typing things into those chats, and so has Julia Baker. Thanks for your help. Certainly last week we were really busy with that. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of our contributors, of course. We couldn't have done it without you. All of those people who made those films, did the voiceovers, helped with the editing, sent the pictures in. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That was absolutely sensational. Yeah, it couldn't have been much better. But last, and very definitely not least, we have to thank Dundragon Rewilding Centre up in Scotland. It was fantastic to learn all about the important rewilding work you're doing get up close and personal with all those kind of projects and see that long-term vision of what the wilds of scotland will look like in only a matter of a few decades and of course the british wildlife center who have been so hospitable enabling us to get up close to these marvelous animals getting sites that we haven't seen before interactions getting us to kind of give a little tickle and especially to matt binstead absolutely. who's been absolutely brilliant this week matt's yeah. been oh. wrangling all of the animals <laughs> bringing in the harvest mice bang on time sorting out the owls the otters the badgers and the foxes matt you've been absolutely yeah. sensational thank you very much indeed yeah. yeah it's been absolutely brilliant and we can't thank you all enough for joining and watching it wouldn't be without the generosity of all of you watching as well as all of the team here we're a small team but we've done our absolute best to kind of give you that nature escapism and it's been an absolute pleasure so we're going to play out with a song, which we thought would be a good idea. So we've got a track now from a band called Storn Away. It's got a very natural history content, this one. Listen to all of the words. And you never know, you might see out of ten bats on your screens again sometime relatively soon. Storn Away. Sarah. Boom went the bitten from the back of the marsh. Wet my lips, said the quail in the tall grass. Yellow hammer sings from the top of the tree for a little bit of bread and no cheese. Teacher, teacher, said the tits on the feeder. Pink, said the finch from the table of seeds. Chip, chaff, chip, chaff, said its own name. And I wish they all did the same. Like the cuckoo, 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 cuckoo. To wit, to woo, said the owl in the evening. Cock a doodle doo, said the chicken in the morning. Nightingale sings for the whole night through, and you can hear them in the daytime too. I'm boring, I'm boring Do you hear what the collar dove is calling? While the swifts arrive from many miles away And they shout and they scream all day With a bitten from the back of the marsh, wet my lips, said the quail in the tall grass. Yellow hammer sings from the top of a tree, for it's a bit of bread and no cheese. Teacher, teacher, said the tits on the feed, and pink, said the finch from the table of seas. Chip, chap, chip, chap, said its own name. And I wish they all did the same.